I'm going to scoot this up a little, a little cozier. Thank you so much, Nancy Hanna. What a beautiful meditation on prayer. What a beautiful way to start us from a beautiful heart. And I do want to thank Carolyn Rudnick and Carrie Winter and Holly Kennedy and the amazing women's ministry team for the tremendous care, the tremendous work they have put into this conference to allow us to come together and encourage one another to flourish. Thank you. Thank you for letting me join today. My name is Mary Battelle, and my husband Michael and I have been attending the well for several years, and I wanted to sit and chat with you today and talk a little bit about story. I'll kick us off with a little mini story, I guess, on encouragement for anybody who might be able to relate. Um, my husband is a huge encourager. He's got a wonderfully encouraging heart. He is not a morning person at all, and so we were getting ready this morning and just kind of rushing around because some of the wonderful men of the well came and helped us with parking and some things this morning to set up and he was just kind of chipping in. So we're running around, we haven't had our coffee and uh, he just decided he wanted to encourage me in the middle of it all. So we passed in the hallway, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, you know what, honey, don't be worried about anything. You're going to do great this morning. Just go in there. Don't try to be funny. Don't try to be intelligent. <laughs> Don't try to be charming or clever or witty. Just get up there and be yourself. <laughs> so we have now decided, we've made a pact that we are not going to try to encourage one another now until our caffeine has kicked in. <laughs> and I feel extremely comfortable because we've set the bar nice and low this morning. We're managing expectations. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to forge ahead uh, because I want to specifically talk about the power of sharing our stories with one another. There is a quote that I just love from a very prominent writer and theologian named Frederick Beekner. It, it looks like Buckner, but I believe he pronounces it Beekner, so that's how I'm going to say it. Um, I'll just paraphrase the quote. Basically what he says is it is vitally important that we share our stories with one another, and not just because there are stories, but because when we share them with enough honesty and enough courage and enough humility, people start to realize they share parts of the same story. And when that happens, divisions can come down between us and God can start to move among us. And I love that idea that just by standing in our truth, just being authentic in our stories, it invites God in. So accordingly, I'm just, just a tiny little bit of my, of my story that I'll share. I come from a fairly musical family. Um, I spent all my little girlhood uh, singing hymns and harmonies, and as I grew up, I started learning a bunch of instruments. And so I've, I've played in all sorts of music ensembles through the years. I've been extremely blessed to play and serve in a bunch of praise and worship capacities, even in a small way on our wonderful uh, well praise and worship team. I've been able to serve just a little bit there, and it's been, it's been wonderful. Um, and I also also teach music students of all ages, different instruments, and one thing I especially love, I have used music in a supportive capacity to help s encourage developmentally disabled children, because it turns out that music is extremely therapeutic when it comes to things like language and social development and coordination. So in all these different capacities over time, I have come to think of music as a prayer language, just a language all its own. I have seen it repeatedly reach hearts and spirits and minds uh, in ways that sometimes nothing else can. Um, and if you think about it, I guess a song is like a story, you know, beginning to middle to end. So I'll talk about our stories today, sharing our stories kind of from the standpoint of a music analogy because it's just, it's just what I'm familiar with. So before I get started, I, it's something I'm just curious about. A show of hands, show of hands, how many women here today would say that your life story is going 100% exactly the way that you had always hoped and planned that it would? <laughs> show of hands. Okay. So we're all in good company. I was hoping for some hands, like we could have an impromptu panel and you could tell us how the heck you accomplished that. Because right from the time we're little girls, it, we're so specific. We can draw pictures. We can play act how we want our story to go, right? And then we start to grow up, 
and life starts to happen and things can go a little off track or sometimes life will take a screaming left turn or several and we can be left in a place where the story we're living doesn't necessarily fit the story we had envisioned. Kind of brings me to why I'm sitting in this chair today. This was not the plan. I was going to just get up and talk to you and walk around like I normally would. I struggle with a health affliction that has prevented me, actually, from playing the bass guitar with our awesome, awesome praise and worship team. And I know that's kind of weird and unusual. I'm a grown woman. I play the bass guitar. But I love to do that, especially in a praise and worship capacity. And for several months, I have not been able to do it at all. And so this affliction really kicked in this week. I don't know why. God knows why. Okay. And so we decided I'm just going to sit in the chair. It doesn't bother me because I feel like we're all just kind of sitting and having coffee. So I'm fine with it, but I wanted to sort of explain it, and I appreciate you kind of to bearing with me as I, sit, as I sit and talk to you today. And I don't necessarily expect everybody here to understand that particular circumstance, you know, the thing that I just described, that, that trial or that thorn. But I know, I know that every single person here can understand what it feels like to have something happen or to have something not happen that brings you to a place where you are standing or you are sitting or you are kneeling on the floor and you are saying, God, how can you possibly use me now? How can you use me like this? I think our women's hearts can make that even a little bit tougher. We have these beautiful women's heart postures. They're so nurturing. They're so caring. We want to pour everything we have into everything that life brings our way. And that's kind of a tall order because life can, let's be honest, kind of pile it on. Most women I know have a huge arrangement of things that they have to deal with all the time. It can be kind of overwhelming, right? There's home and there's family and there's school and there's church and there's work and there's kids and there's friends and there's planning a women's conference and all of these things. And we're just trying to do the best we can for all of the things that are coming into our lives. And so I guess from a music analogy, it feels like I got to be the lead singer. I got to hold up all these notes. I got to be front and center. I got to hit everything just right, right? I don't know if our culture does us any favors in this regard necessarily. I mean, think about, I mean, think about social media. Like, it's not good enough to just put your favorite snapshot out on, on Facebook. You need to shoot for like 167 likes for that to count, right? It's not good enough to tweet. You got to trend. You got to be viral. You got to be an influencer. The words that we choose, the words that we use over and over. They seem to reinforce this idea, for whatever reason we've come up with, that that to be of influence, you need to be in the center. You need to be completely approved, completely lauded, completely applauded. People kind of put you up there and wait for you to pronounce things down, and they sort of mimic what you do, and they follow what you do. That, to our human way of thinking, that to our culture, is what influence, you know, often looks like. But think about, think about our awesome wall praise team. Think about our awesome wall praise team, right? All different people on this stage, all standing on the same level. And what you hear is one beautiful, single, finished song, right? But if you were to point to anybody, if you were to point to Carrie or to Emily or anybody on the team and say, what, to play me what you're playing, sing me what you're singing you might not hear something that sounds an awful lot like the finished song. Maybe it's a harmony. Maybe it's a rhythm. Maybe it's a drum beat, right? So again, you get this final, beautiful, finished song. And all of these pieces kind of fit together like puzzle pieces to create it, and they're all vital to create it. And if you back any one of them out, you don't get the finished song the way that it's supposed to sound. So the first thing I want to get across this morning is God can use you powerfully to create an influence from anywhere you are situated. And if you doubt that, 
If you doubt that idea for a second, think about Scripture. Think about Jesus. Think about the people Jesus chose. Because to our human way of thinking, to our culture, right, it would seem reasonable that Jesus would need to reach into that center area. He'd need to reach into those applauded, those accepted, those admired folks. That's who he would need to consult and pick to carry his message. But he didn't often reach into the center. He didn't reach into the middle. Oftentimes he reached into the margins. He reached into the fringes and he picked a bunch of people that are very unexpected to our cultural way of thinking and he used them so powerfully that we are still talking about them today. He can use you powerfully to create an influence anywhere you are, anytime he wants. And somebody here today needs to hear that right now. Right now. Now, how many women, how many people here, you've seen like a symphony orchestra, right? Most people, you guys have seen an orchestra before, okay? I'll use this as an example because I played in a lot of orchestral kind of ensembles. So here's an example. So, so you picture like your average symphony orchestra, lots of people on the stage, and they're all playing all different instruments, all different parts, right? And usually what you see is a man or a woman standing in front of them on a box, or on a platform, and what is that person doing? Usually something like this, right? Conducting, directing. This individual understands this is how the song's going to go from beginning to end. They've got the road map. And so if you watch that ensemble for any length of time, you'll notice, you know, some glancing, some looking. People just want to make sure they don't miss a cue, you know, that they're going to follow the song appropriately from beginning to end. Same thing with our awesome, awesome praise team, Matt and his phenomenal team, right? There's usually a praise and worship leader somewhere in that ensemble, and they know how the song goes from beginning to end. So if you watch long enough, you see, you know, glancing. You see people just looking. They want to make sure that they catch the cues. I will tell you firsthand from firsthand experience, few things are more humiliating than when your praise and worship leader decides the song is now going to end and you're still jamming in the back because you didn't get the visual memo, <laughs> right? It's like, bless you, but we stopped four measures ago. It's, you know, and it's embarrassing. So this idea of paying attention, paying attention to the, to the cues. Now think about, think about Proverbs 3. Think about Proverbs 3, 5, 6. How does it go? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will. He will direct. He will direct. God is the divine director. God has the road map for how the song is going to go, how the life is going to go, how the proceedings are going to go, right? Here's a really uncomfortable truth, actually, that we don't like to admit to ourselves too much, usually. We don't actually have the song sheet at all in terms of being able to predict what is happening. We don't know what's going to happen from week to week, from day to day, from hour to hour, hence me sitting in this chair today, right? We don't know how things are going to go. And so God is saying, I see your busyness. I see all the things your woman's heart is being asked to do, but make no mistake from day to day, from minute to minute, from heartbeat to heartbeat. Look at me. Look to me. And I will give you the cue. I will give you the next cue for the song of your life, for the way it's going to go. Part of that cueing is giving us clues, giving us insights into maybe the kind of instrument we were created to play, you know, figuratively, the kind of voice that we're supposed to have in the world. Because again, let's face it, we all think we need to be the lead singer. I've got this huge to-do list. I've got to hold it all up. I got to be front and center, got to be the lead singer. Statistically speaking, the world currently has just under 4 billion women. I'm going to tell you that no band anywhere ever needed 4 billion lead singers. It stands to reason many of us in this room 
are not created to be the lead singer. And that's not just okay. That is necessary to the composition God is trying to share with the world. Right? So as a female bass player, just to throw it out there, just a suggestion, maybe, again, figuratively, just think, talking about your voice, your influential voice in the world, maybe God has created you to be the bass player. And thank you for the stunned silence. I did not expect thunderous applause for that. Nobody, none of my students line up to play the bass, right? You just, exactly, they don't. It's not a front of mind instrument, right? It, I had a student named Robbie. He was 12 years old, and I said to him one day, Robbie, I think you'd be an awesome bass player. What, you know, what are your thoughts? Robbie, 12 years old, looks me right in the face, and he said, let me get this straight. You think I am the perfect guy to go stand in the back corner in the dark and play a bunch of notes that are too low for most people even to hear. <laughs> it's a banner day when you get owned by a sixth grader I don't even know what I said back, but he's right, because he's right. You know, it's the, the no, sometimes the notes are so low, you don't really hear them with your ears. So it's not one of those forward in the mix, you know, top of mind kind of instruments. However, however, I would argue that if God, again, figuratively has, has created you to be a bass player, that's your voice in the world, He's made you to be a bass player. That is a formidable, that is a powerful position to be in. There's several reasons. It's just in the interest of time, I'll share three today. I'm going to call them the three R's. It's my shout out to Robbie, because Robbie, you know where you are. But let's call them the three R's. Okay, so the first R is rhythm. The bass is a rhythm instrument. So the bass player and the drummer, they lock in together and they keep the song on track, right, all the way through. If that doesn't happen, if they fail in that responsibility, the song goes off the rails. I mean, to think about that next time you're singing in your car or you're singing your favorite, the rhythm is kind of a big deal. So rhythm is number one. The second R is the root, and I promise you, you don't have to understand music theory to get the root. I'll kind of oversimplify it, but the root note is like the foundational note of a chord. Uh, it sort of steers the way the chord is going to go. Think of it like the rudder of a boat, sort of. The rudder's like under the boat. You don't really, you're not aware of it, but it's sort of steering the way the boat is going. So the root note. So like if the entire praise team played their note, and I, as the bass player, played one root note. The song sounds like it's going to keep going. If I play a different root note, the song sounds like it's going to end. And that maybe doesn't sound powerful until you pick the wrong note and you get some side eye from the band. It's kind of a big thing to pick the correct note so the song does what it needs to do. So the root or the rudder. Now, the third R is my favorite R. In all of bass playing, it is the rumble. When the bass comes in, it fills the room. It fills the sanctuary. It rounds out the sound. You don't hear it in your ear. You feel it in your chest. You feel it in the pit of your stomach. I had a student named Hannah who was eight years old, and she said, when I hear that bass come in, I feel like I'm hearing the heartbeat of God. And I don't think that's too far from the truth. So maybe God created your voice to be one of the bass player, right? Maybe you are keeping somebody's life on track. Maybe you're the rudder. Maybe you are just encouraging from the sidelines and you're coaxing, you're nudging somebody along who secretly doesn't feel like they could keep going except for your encouragement. Maybe when somebody sees you, or hears you in action, they experience the heartbeat of God. Maybe you're the bass player. And what that means is if you don't play the note God has assigned you, if you stop playing the note God has assigned you, if you get nervous, if you pull back, if you hesitate, if you get afraid, if you walk out of the room, if you stop playing your note, people are going to notice. 
And they're not just going to notice top of mind. They're going to notice in their heart. They're going to notice in the center of their being. And I am sitting in this chair today so I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, I understand what it feels like to feel insufficient. I understand what it feels like to feel uncertain, like you're not really up to the task. I get it. I think all of us understand that. It's not something we are normally comfortable talking about. Maybe we feel like we're not supposed to. But I think a lot of us get that. So I want to share with you today just another musical concept, the concept of the grace note. The grace note is something that I would normally play on the cello or the violin. It's a second note. It kind of hooks into the main note. And it adds just some character. It adds some beauty. It's just a second note, and it kind of hooks into that main note, and there's a little break in the middle. And I love the idea of the grace note because it's the little break that brings the grace in. It's the little break. It's the thing our human understanding would call the imperfection or the fracture or the frailty. It's the little break. Sometimes people need to hear the little break in your melody. They need to see the little imperfection in your story to relate to you, and that is how God finds the way in. So just play your note. There's some song lyrics I want to share with you as I kind of close out today. They're the song lyrics to a song called Anthem by Leonard Cohen, and the chorus is hanging on my wall. And here's how it goes. He says, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. It's how the light gets in. So our praise team is going to start making their way up to the stage. And as they do, I just want to invite you to do a few things this morning. First of all, start listening for all of these vital instruments, all of these vital voices and how they contribute to the song because they all influence how that song sounds. And secondly, and, and even more importantly, find a woman today. Could be your mother, sister, aunt, grandma, could be the lady sitting right next to you or maybe someone you talked to walking in this morning. Find a woman today Look her right in the eyes. Very sincerely say to her, I see this in you. Not just you're beautiful, not just you're awesome. Those are lovely things to say. There's nothing wrong with those things. But be specific. I see this in you. And then tell her sincerely, this is how your note has brought grace into my life. This is how your melody is bringing light into the world. When you are specific with that language, you do two things for that woman. Number one, you help her understand this is the instrument God has created you to play. And number two, you reassure her and you remind her, this is how God sees you two. What I see in all of you this morning are the faces of strong and radiant and resilient and wise and wonderful and beautiful and powerful women. And you are all created to play very, very different instruments in very vital ways. Just play your note. Because even if it feels imperfect, that might be what somebody needs 
to see, to let God in. So just play your note, and I promise you, you will flood this world with grace and with light and with the glory of our Savior. Bless you. Thank you for letting me join you this morning and have a beautiful conference.